Welcome everyone. We're joined today by Stacy Robinson Brown, Alex Hodgins, and Todd Pryor. This panel will discuss a local collaboration project that formed as a response to the Yukon Substance Use Health Emergency. Thank you all for taking the time to share with us today. Thank you, Emma. Just before we get started, Alex is going to lead us in a land acknowledgement. Um, hello, everyone. Hopefully you can uh, hear me now. So yeah, I just wanted to start by, by first of all, thanking uh, you for allowing us to speak today at this uh, important summit. Uh, I wanted to take a minute to acknowledge uh, that we're here before you today uh, as visitors on the, the Kwanla Dun and Tan Kuchin Council's traditional territory. Um, also myself personally, um, as a community coordinator with uh, Blood Ties for Direction Center, I hope to align myself with promoting the temporary and evolving self-representing bodies of all 14 Yukon First Nations who I partner with. Uh, further, as a researcher, I think it's important to acknowledge the uh, connections that exist between research and the settler colonial state uh, that we exist within uh, and the brutalities that um, come along uh, with that uh, state's existence for indigenous populations. Uh, and lastly, I just wanna say that uh, combating this current uh, overdose uh, state of emergency that we find ourselves in in the Yukon uh, must be coupled uh, with decolonization efforts. Um, yeah, so thanks. And maybe I'll pass it back over to uh, Todd to talk a little bit more about our specific initiative. Thanks, Alex. Um, I think the we, we share those sentiments for sure that, that Alex just expressed in terms of a land acknowledgement and also acknowledging that the work that we're going to talk about today occurred on Karkos Tagish First Nation traditional territory. It wouldn't be uh, possible to have done this work together without the foresight and flexibility in terms of service delivery and how to respond in difficult times. The Karkos Tagish First Nation Health and Wellness Department showed. And, and what we were able to do together is this Connecting for Hope Overdose, Overdose Awareness campaign. It's a harm reduction outreach campaign that was in the, in the planning stages before, before the state of emergency was declared, but we were certainly spurred into action um, because of losses that impacted the community. We, what, what resulted was a, I think, somewhat out of the box responsive approach to connect to as many people as, as widely as possible across the community in terms of harm reduction and education. We were able to act quickly because of, I think, an established focus on communication between between blood dyes for, for directions, which is an NGO, between Carcross Tagish First Nation, and between uh, mental wellness and substance use services, um, as well as support from community members and other nations as well. And, and Stacy will get more into some of the details of those pieces. So Stacy, I can go to the next slide and maybe you could share a little bit about what brought us together and some of the context that I just talked about. Yeah, thanks, Todd. Um, so my name is Stacey Robinson Brown. I am the health and wellness director for Carcross Tagish First Nation. Um, <clears throat> it, not that there's really one particular um, thing that contributed to, I think that it's really is an amalgamation of things um, between the isolation um, factor with, I mean, everyone can, um, has their own experiences in what the, what the COVID-19 pandemic has, has influenced their life. Um, but really, uh, First Nation people are, are very social and spiritual beings. And so, oh, I think, thanks, Todd. Um, and so I think it really does play in um, people's ability to cope with when they're in such an isolated state. Um, so I just wanted to make that um, kind of make that point in terms that is that has been um, it is it has been expressed by many different citizens that it has been an issue um, all the way across. Um, so starting kind of in December, there was um, a lot of um, non-fatal overdoses um, that we've seen in, in the community of Carcross. Um, in January, the, within the first um, week or so, um, there was a six day period where, where there was three citizens who had passed um, due to an overdose. And there was others that were non-fatal overdoses. Um, so this, um, this is what spurred um, Carcross Tagish First Nation on the 12th of January to announce, uh, declare a state of emergency. Um, and since that state uh, of emergency, there has been more passings um, due to overdoses. So I just want to um, acknowledge that there is, um, the community is hurting, um, that the people are hurting 
um, and just with limited ability to to grieve, right? Uh, there's no potlatches. There's um, not very many people can gather. Um, I do, however, want to say um, I want to kind of honor our Dhaka Nation, which is um, the Teslin Plinkett Council, um, which is in Teslin and the Taku River Plinkett First Nation, um, which is in Atlin and with Carcross Tagish First Nation. Um, I just want to honor them because as soon as um, the deaths were announced, um, they immediately came forward and offered support. Um, with traditional food, cultural support, um, with wood for ceremonial fire. Um, so much respect for, for the, the Dhaka Nation. Um, and of course, it also inspir uh, inspired a lot of community um, individuals, community members um, coming forward, the local uh, church, um, community members offering to do workshops like supporting sobriety. We also had um, Narcotics Anonymous come out. Um, and I really wanna focus on um, the collaboration that we had with mental wellness substance use um, and Todd is, is here to represent that and um, also uh, stepping up as well and uh, between the three of us we were able to kind of go into that um, really fine-tuning support and what that looks like in the community very in individual um, and I also want to say too that Yukon government also followed up with their own state of emergency um, and really it is with any state of emergency, it's a call to action. And so the commitment of, of everyone to work together um, in just in, in honor of what has happened, acknowledging the grief and being able to um, focus on um, moving forward in a good way. Um, I just wanna make one more kind of statement. Um, in 2021, the Yukon Coroner Services indicated that the Yukon overdose um, sorry, the Yukon's op opiate overdose rate per capita has been the highest in Canada um, with a reported 48.4 deaths per 100,000. I think they'll be released, just one sec. Okay. Perfect. Um, so I just wanted to mention that this really is a silent crisis in the territory. Um, and although Karkras Tagish um, has really been affected, um, we do acknowledge that there, this is, this is much bigger and it is all across um, the Yukon. Um, yeah, so um, if you wanna to go to the next slide. Sure. Um, and maybe Alex can talk a little bit about uh, blood ties. Yeah, so um, can you hear me now or? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, so just wanted to uh, take a step back, I guess, to uh, sort of introduce the organization that, that I'm a part of. Um, uh, and uh, then we'll go from there and, and talk a bit more about the partnership um, that's existed uh, in, in direct response in, in Car Cross. So, Blood Ties, um, and just want to read our mission statement. Uh, is to eliminate barriers and create opportunities for people to have equal access uh, to health and wellness and to live in dignity uh, in the throughout the greater Yukon uh, community. Um, and so my role through Blood Ties uh, is uh, essentially education and services uh, outside of Whitehorse um, surrounding harm reduction and overdose prevention. So I engage with various uh, community stakeholders um, and assess their, their various needs and uh, capacities uh, to respond. Um, and I take a community and client-centered approach to this. Uh, more specifically, some of the, the projects I've been working on are uh, some uh, drug checking within the communities and uh, naloxone training and distribution and access. Uh, but uh, for the uh, this uh, initiative we're speaking about today, I ended up uh, sort of, I guess, getting pulled into being more uh, on the ground uh, in, in Car Cross. So uh, maybe we can move to the next slide and speak a bit more about that. Sure, yeah, I'll just give a brief sort of background on, on mental illness and substance use services community hubs. And uh, right. we're sort of uh, a, a north and south sort of model where there's four hubs across the territory. Each hub has staff and some other communities that are close by or are serviced by that hub and or have, have local staff members. Um, uh, in, in, in Car Cross, 
or actually right, the goal then, I think the, the, the approach that we want to have in mind when, when looking at these hubs and services and communities is adapting, developing and evolving in terms of staffing and approach, working to remain flexible and adaptive to the needs of, of a given community and, and feedback and communication uh, certainly helps with that. Um, because our biggest success or our biggest sort of, um, yeah, our biggest success counselor was a joint effort between Department of Education, Mental Wellness, and, and Stacy was there too for the interviews so, uh, with Car Cross Tigers First Nation Health and Wellness. We recently brought in a community counselor, and I think importantly for this project, that community counselor came with a passion and a drive and sort of a trailblazing spirit um, uh, that has to do with harm reduction and outreach. So acknowledging Michael for his, his work and his on the ground work, as well as um, on Stacy's team, the Help and Wellness Car Cross Tigers First Nation, uh, Lee and, and Alex for, for the work that they've done directly on the ground, um, making sure that what we did was possible in a timely fashion and, and, and we were able to reach and continue to be able to reach because this is ongoing as many folks as possible. So that's just a brief on the three of us and, and where we are sort of positioned and we will talk more about the actual collaboration uh, with the next slide. I think importantly, talking about collaborative conversations, like this is a collaborative effort where we see a, a, a NGO, we see blood ties, we see a First Nations government, we see a territorial government who, who when, when the news came out that there was loss that was impacting the community connected to the substance use health emergency, we were literally on the phone with each other, um, probably couldn't get through because the other person was calling the other person type thing. Um, I think that kind of focus and that kind of ongoing communication, even when things are, are well, certainly when things are not in, in, in like a critical stage, sort of sets the stage for a relationship between governments, and between organizations that, that opens up to being flexible and adapting and maybe pivoting the work that we're doing on a day-to-day -day basis so that we can meet the need that's, needs that are emergent. Um, Stacey, what do you think? Do you think there's more to say on that? Um, yeah, I actually, I really liked how you, when you were mentioning about um, kind of having that relationship before a crisis hit, um, I think really made the difference um, because we were already kind of in conversation about other day-to-day -day things. And um, I think that once, once the, the crisis happened, it was, um, you know, immediately on the phone, like, how can we help? Um, and so I think that really contributed to how well it went yeah. um, because as much as you know there's there's goods and bads and lesson learns I think that sure. um, it was really seamless in terms of okay this is what's happening you know let's let's chat about it let's make a plan and then move forward and speaking of of, of that sort of same thing for you Alex I think that, that like I, I met you in car cross that's where we were able to first connect and so blood ties having a presence in the community and all of us coming together in the community I think led to important conversations Mm -hmm. um yeah definitely i mean i think uh something something of note is just uh because we uh you know we we've been in contact previously and we're we're talking through i guess like uh different options and plans uh for collaborating in the community uh basically when when the crisis hit at the start of january we were able to just call that emergency meeting and essentially that day yeah. we we decided um you know that that we would start the campaign like right then and we would get you know get people on the ground uh, <laughs> like the next day and, and just and get it moving and um yeah i think this this whole collaboration uh is a really great example of how actionable items uh in times of need can can move forward we, we also immediately. had just thinking about that what you just said having that emergency meeting and, and being in the community um sitting at a table having discussions about what do we do now i think we started with a discussion of like the long-term goals and objectives we talked about previously back in December. And then we kind of shrunk it back down to like medium-term goals. Okay, what do we do in the next few months? And I think the conversation had to turn like, like what do we do now? What can we do now to get to get naloxone kids, to get education as far and wide as possible? And how can we use each of our reaches to do that? I think in the most appropriate way, because I mean, I've said it a hundred times in this small group that like we wouldn't necessarily go to car cross and go door to door. But if Car Cross Tag is First Nation has the communication channels and the the, uh, the the foresight to say this is something we can work out and make it appropriate, we're certainly willing to sort of adapt 
and, and, and do that with alongside Cargos Tagus First Nation. So that was kind of a beautiful, um, I guess, acknowledgement or, or, or showing of why the different perspectives are important. Because even if we can, like Stacey, your team could hand out naloxone kits, uh, blood ties could hand out naloxone kits, we can hand out naloxone kits, but we all have a certain perspective and a certain positionality, I think, that allows us to do things in like a more fulsome way. So I think that's what we were able to, to, to show. When, when we had those meetings as well, we literally had citizens walk in the door and say, this is what I could contribute. So having that space in the health and wellness being uh, building in, uh, in Carcross was also, I think, huge to allow that, that sort of emergent kind of synchronistic uh, bit to happen. Yeah, yeah. I think, I, oh, sorry, go ahead, Sandy. <laughs> um, and I think it's good that there, there were citizens, there were people with lived experience, they were yeah. saying like, I know that this is gonna work. And, um, you know, who can I, who can I share my story with? And, you know, what happens with that afterwards? And I think that it was so important that, um, I mean, like when you're saying Todd citizens came in and said, you know, this is how we can support. And, um, it, it was great to hear directly from people and saying like what they need and then action on, on that. Almost like they were coming in to say, can I do this? But really our only response was gratitude. You know what I mean? In terms of adding more to what we were trying to put together together. Um, we also, so the, the citizens came in, there were groups that came from that. There was, there was education sessions involved. And I know that I talked with Michael, our staff on the ground and Lee and Alex yourself involved in education sessions that um, where well, elders were taught things about harm reduction and, and opioid use and, and the state of emergency and, and the family council were, were taught about the same things. And like when I talked to Michael, he said he expected to go in and do an naloxone training for, for 20 minutes, but it was a two hour conversation of, of perspectives opening and, 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 and shifts happening in the room. And I think that for him and for, for me from this vantage point as well is like, fills my heart and, and it goes back to the idea of hope. Um, which, uh, which Gary talked about in the last session uh, quite poignantly. Um, so the education sessions were there. There was also the door-to-door -door campaign, which we'll talk a little bit more about. Um, and in the newspaper, Stacey, you mentioned it a bit as well. Um, you had other nations coming down the highway to support directly. So this kind of like blossomed into something that was so emergent and out of our control from our first conversation, certainly not to do with us but it became just such a bigger community connection thing and a bigger, a bigger, a bigger thing. It was quite beautiful. Yeah. And, and really to honor DACA, I mean, they are, um, DACA is the three um, First Nations. They're all um, inland Tlingit people. Um, and they have made um, in the past a declaration to, you know, help and support one another. And there's a lot of initiatives that um, the three nations are on, together. And I think that, you know, when, when push comes to shove, um, uh, much, so much love and, and connection with them for what they could share that was outside of, um, you know, any kind of organized per se, like um, we had a moose um, donated to feed the people at the ceremonial fire that happened at the Hashigunhini. We also had, um, you know, a couple cords of wood that was donated as well. And um, and just having supports, having elders from all the communities come together. And um, it, it was um, very much um, helpful and it helped so many people. And, and also they reached out to the families of lost ones um, and just said like, you know, how can I help? You know, maybe it's prayer, maybe it's smudge, maybe, uh, maybe you need a couple of things from the store. Like, um, and really just like that, you know, very, human to human um, connection that, that people really need. Yeah, I watched uh, Gary Bailey's talk with Cameron Grandy uh, just before this one and a lot of moments of that were really poignant and they keep coming back to me. And, and one of the things that he said right before I had to go and join this was, was we're all in this together. I think he's a musician, <laughs> um, so we're all in this together. And that's what that sort of thing is like even more than we know, you know what I mean? Like there was so many things come together for for car cross and the citizens and the support effort. The, the thing that we wanna focus on now is that door-to-door -door campaign, which like I said, it, it, without the flexibility and foresight of car cross tech, first nation, the willingness of the frontline staff, and that includes Alex, 
to go out there and, and, and really go in deeply to connect with citizens, to connect with community members. Um, I don't know if it would have happened in that swift of way. And it, it, like, it's ongoing, the, the dates are listed on the slide, but uh, things shift and change and we have more to do and we're gonna continue to do more. So Alex, given that you were, you were there, <laughs> do you wanna talk a little bit about what exactly happened? I know we have numbers on the slide, but. Yeah, definitely happy to. Um, so I think, and maybe maybe just before I jump into that, yeah. just uh, just speaking to the way that this, uh, you know, the response from from the greater um, greater kind of a clinket community, I guess, yeah. was really felt. Um, for example, like I was down in in Teslin, um, and maybe similarly to Mike's experience with with various trainings that are currently happening, I was down in Teslin um, for a short uh, uh, test strip uh, for for drug checking and. Uh, naloxone training uh, that, you know, maybe <laughs> it technically to, to show that process would take about 15 minutes, but I similarly ended up being there all day long, just having conversations and, and people sort of asking like, what can be their part and, and wanting to learn and wanting to be part of this response. So um, yeah, yeah, that's just, uh, you know, something, this momentum and this, this interest is, uh, is just really not, not way, way beyond anything that we could have predicted. Um but yeah, in terms of um, in terms of the actual campaign, so uh, yeah, and again, uh, uh, yeah, I'm happy you, you mentioned Mike's name, and then uh, Lee also working with with CTFN was on the ground with, with myself a lot. But um, yeah, so essentially our plan um, as of I think it was January 12th when we met, uh, and I think that night uh, Mike followed me back to White Horse, and then we essentially raided uh, the blood pie supply of various. Uh, drug testing uh, and, and safer use equipment um, so that we'd be able to, to get uh, those resources and material out to folks uh, in Carcross right away. Uh, and then, yeah, we hit the ground running and, and up on the, um, the slide here is just um, six, a six day cross section, uh, which you can see of all the different stuff we were able to uh, get out to folks. Um, and again, yeah, we're not finished yet. Uh, and, uh, you know, overall the, uh, the response has been really positive. Uh, you know, not, not every, every household is, is necessarily interested in um, all, all this different, this uh, all that we have to offer, but uh, you know, every spot that I visited was appreciative of the conversation. Um, and, you know, something that we believe as an organization is that this discussion around substance use isn't, you know, isn't just for substance users and those around them. It's for everyone to be having right now. So that's why we made a, a priority and we're trying to get to every single house in Carcross. And, and that's something that's really exciting. Something, uh, something else that I think is really exciting is that um, we have, we, we, we've sort of identified a number of community gatekeepers. And, and I think what that, from what Michael was telling me, from what we talked about, Alex, is that people would, would approach because they knew we had people out from about four to six every evening distributing things and say, I know some folks who could use this particular item of safer use. I can be a person who can take this from you and make sure it gets to the people who are going to use it. Same as naloxone kits. So we've identified people with lived experience or people who are connected with people with lived experience who could, who could work with us and alongside us. I know that's a small piece of involving people with lived experience and there's a lot of work to do as to how to do that in a more robust way, but it's a, it's a beautiful start, I think. Well, yeah, definitely. And I think that's something that's huge and that's something we try and push for as well, because just given the the huge amount of stigma that still exists with, um, with substance use, you know, if we're able to get um, safe, safer use, uh, equipment or, or testing to one person and they're able to get it to those people that aren't, you know, aren't at a stage where they're comfortable coming to service providers like that is that is really a big step forward and not something, you know, that uh, that we were previously seeing very much of. So, yeah. yeah, I think that we have a few minutes left and I want to make sure we get to the last slide. Sure. I think we have more questions for ourselves and more uncertainty and more like what what's next now that we've gone through this sort of first phase of, of the response that we put together. Um, then we have answers. And that's sort of the point of this slide is, is first of all, to recognize and appreciate everyone here in the organizations, Carcross Tagus First Nation, especially in terms of, of being able to connect with us and, and, and drive the, the vehicle forward, but also the frontline staff, which we've acknowledged a few times through the presentation, but I think it's okay to do it again, um, for the honestly trail, 
blazing spirit. And that's the words that keep coming to mind is, is um, just the, the forwardness and the willingness to get out there and the passion. Because we didn't, we didn't just say, okay, now this is your job. All these people have jobs and we added to it because we had to, and they were willing and able to jump in and do those things. Um, so Stacy, uh, Alex, in terms of lessons learned or next steps or further coordination, what are your initial thoughts? Are there a few pieces you wanna to touch on before we go? Um, I, yeah. I definitely wanna mention, sorry, Alex. Um, I definitely want to mention like it, it didn't, um, it's not as originally planned. Like we, we put in like, you know, the two week mark, the 12th yeah. is 26. Then, I mean, we're still doing door to doors um, and people are still coming in and asking and they're, you know, and it, um, we also want to do some follow up, but it was, there was so much more, it became a lot more than, yeah. um, than what we originally planned, which is a great thing because I mean, I, I see more people walking through health and wellness um, door and, yeah. um, than I've seen before. And just like, you know, making, really breaking down that, that stigma and, and the barriers for people coming in for service. That's great. Yeah, I think when I talked to Mike, he talked about how do, we, how do we break down the barriers, normalize and, and adapt at a community level to, to have this more welcome than just, and just okay in terms of conversations and supplies. Alex, do you want to? say something as well yeah actually i just saw that a question um for us there and if we had a um, maybe i'll read that out and see sure um what, if we are able to uh, jump in on that right away just because i know we're running out of time here um so the question is what are the largest barriers in the community for harm reduction and treatment and then another question is um well, how the community received uh door to door work um so yeah, I think I can start by speaking sure. to that briefly. So, uh, you know, I, I, every house that I personally went to, um, I had a positive response. I had some really great conversations. Um, something, something that was cool is, is I would, you know, I would go there and they would say, oh yeah, you know, I, I saw that this was happening over, over um, uh, very, very at somewhere else in the community or they'd heard about it or because we didn't we we didn't just sort of start knocking on doors we, yeah. we announced that it was going to happen so people people knew what we were and who we were and what we were doing so they were kind of expecting us which was really nice um you know i i think there there were a couple cases where people weren't specifically interested in the service and that's yeah, okay that's and, okay, and yeah. uh, that's part of the process and you know we, we weren't we weren't trying to we weren't there to push anything on anyone but we were just offering our support um, largest barriers in the community for harm reduction. I, I can speak to that briefly, and then uh, maybe if Stacy wants to, to add to that. Uh, Last minute, pardon me. I think we have about a minute left. <laughs> okay. Uh, so may, maybe actually, Stacy, if you want to speak to the barriers yeah. in the community, since you're the one who spends most time there. Um, to be honest, I think that you almost know everyone who uses, or you know, and there's such a stigma. And I, I think that there needs to be an appreciation of like harm reduction um, and, and use, and it, it's, all in a, it's all on a continuum. Abstinence may not work for everyone, but it might work wonders for other people. Reducing the harm may work for some and not for everyone. And I think just like really breaking down those barriers and saying like, it's okay. Like we love and, and care for you regardless of the choices that you make in life. And I think that um, yeah. really just, like breaking down that barrier and seeing people for who they are and um, supporting them in, you know, whatever that, whatever they need. Yeah. Thank you both for being here. Um, I really appreciate being, we've had this conversation in different ways, but never in such a, like a dynamic way as having to do it live. Um, so I appreciate <laughs> both your presence. I appreciate both your organizations and I loved the work we were able to do together. And as I go back to Gary Bailey, we're, we're, we're all in this together. And I'm and I'm happy to to have been able to talk about it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, Gunashish, thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, thanks everyone.